Good morning. Good morning. We are glad to have you here with us in person, or if you join us on the online, we're glad to have you. Uh, it's just a wonderful day. You know, today's Father's Day. It's the Lord's Day. Uh, we have a few announcements that we need to make real quick. 6.30 this afternoon is evening worship. 6.30 Wednesday, we have adult Bible study, youth Bible study, and team kids. And then we have Vacation Bible School. We have a one-day Vacation Bible School coming up. Saturday, July 17th, it's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if you have any questions or want to know any more about it, talk to Brittany. She's the one that's in charge of it. Uh, are you? <coughs> well, it's, we're going to have a recognition of fathers, and Madonna's got some stuff she wants to pass out, but... Let me say one thing about fathers. The main thing you need to have is a relationship with God the Father. You know, we all have fathers. What was that? What up? Oh. Okay. Done lost control. But no, we all have fathers, you know, and I hope you have a good relationship with your father. But the main thing we pray is that you have a good relationship with God the Father. So, Madonna. Well, we kind of wondered who would do what and all this, but I guess I'll say something about fathers. They are very special. This is a day for them. Uh, I had a wonderful father, and uh, I know that all of you think, Yours is the best, well, mine's the best too, was the best. But anyway, there's a lot of fathers out here in the audience, and we want to recognize you today because it is your day. And it does mean a whole lot to have a godly father. And I, it's like John said, I hope all fathers and all mothers and all children know the heavenly father. That's the one that's the most important. But I want to ask all the fathers to please stand because I'm going to try to get you something. So let's see. Okay, we have. Okay, good. That is great. Uh, we, and then you, I know that there's some families here that got ever the whole family here because it was Father's Day. I think that's so special, and uh, a lot of you. And that's uh, you stand up too because you're representing. For Zach, somebody very special, and that's good too. And I want to try to get you something uh, to to remember. As I walked around out there, I don't know though. Chestine, are you the oldest father here? Yeah, he has to be. 84. Anybody older, any dad older than 84? Let's give him a big hand. We love you all. Y'all may be seated. This is, you read what this says there, you'll be a real man let God lead the way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we just thank you for each and everyone that's here. We have a lot of uh, guests with us today, a lot of visitors. We just, just thank you for that. We just pray for Brother John as he brings a message to us today, and we pray that you just empower him with the Holy Spirit. We pray for Gary as he does the music, Lord, and the musicians. And Lord, we just ask you to 
be with us in this service and I pray that it's a there's somebody here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This song says, I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never leave me no matter where I go, for he knows my name. Would you join me in worship this morning? Would you stand in the Lord's presence? The Lord is a father to the fatherless. He loves you today. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought he sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call here it is now I have a father he calls me his own he'll never leave me no matter where I go He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tear that falls And hears me when I call He knows my name He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tear that falls And hears me when I call As morning dawns and evening fades you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name your name there's a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder because nothing has the power to save but your name say that name jesus in your name we pray come and fill our hearts today lord give us strength to live for you and glorify your name oh your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder because nothing has the power to save but your name oh your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder because nothing has the power to save but your name. Please remain standing in honor of God's word. God's word says in Psalm 68, verse 4 through 6, Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Father, creator, 
Master and Lord, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring, you are worthy. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise, worthy of reverence, worthy of fear, worthy of love and devotion, worthy of bowing and bending of knees, worthy of all this and added to these, Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Almighty Father, Almighty Father, Master and Lord, King of all kings and Redeemer, wonderful Counselor. Savior and source of lift it up in the house today. Lord, you are worthy, Father, Creator, you are worthy, Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy. Of, sing that chorus once again. Oh, you are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship. And praise. Amen. You may be seated. Can somebody testify to that today? Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. He's here today. We're going to have a time of just instrumental meditation. And, uh, and then Julia Shankles is going to come and share our message and song today.
Well, the words are going to be on the screen, so like every time I ask you to, can you please sing with me? I know you know the song. Mason's filling in for his daddy. Doing a good job. Y'all praise and worship with me this morning. Y'all stand. Y'all go ahead and stand.
Look here, sir, there's a lot of family here today. And I think if anybody got the award for the most, it'd be Butch and Jenny. <laughs> two rows here. We're glad to have you all here. But John. Good morning. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen. It's our day. We may not get another day out of the whole year, but this one's ours. Amen. And I'm going to eat what I want to today. Amen. <laughs> what a guy. The scripture is pretty clear. There's a great, um, I'm not going to say burden, a great responsibility placed on the shoulders of men. And I'm going to say this, that as I see our American society failing, and it is doing so at a tremendous rate, I place a lot of that on the shoulders of the men of this country because it seems that somehow we may have lost our way. You can't be God's man and be selfish. You can't be a man of God. You can't be a man of God and think about yourself and yourself only. You are an individual that is called on by God to invest yourself, to invest yourself, to give yourself away as much as you possibly can to the lives of others, particularly of your family. Because I'm gonna say this, if a man fails at home, it doesn't really matter what else he succeeds at, he's failed. And we really, really need strong men in America today. Turn with me, if you will, to the sixth chapter. I'm going to read one verse, but don't get too excited. Y'all know I can do crazy things with one verse. The sixth chapter of Ephesians and the fourth verse. Now, in the preceding chapter, we've been told that we are to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. The women are dealt with in their role in the home, and the men are dealt with in their role pertaining to the, to the wife, which we're not going to escape this morning. I'm going to go back and pick that up, okay? But we get down to the fourth verse of the sixth chapter, and the scripture reads like this. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training, the nurture, and the admonition of the Lord. You fathers, what about us fathers? Well, let's talk about us for a little bit. Ladies, y'all can put it on cruise control. And I'm going to be talking to us guys this morning. And I want you to know something, men. I cannot read this scripture without being indicted myself. Because God holds us to a very strict standard of what we are to be. The first thing I want to deal with, if y'all are counting points, I've got three of them this morning, okay? I, just three, not seven, like I normally do. Um... Uh, is that we need to be men. We need to be men. We've lost what manhood is supposed to be in America. Uh, my dad was, and he's been with the Lord for 62 years now. But in the time that I had him in my life, that man made such an indelible impression on my life that my memories of him 62 years after the fact are just as vivid as they were the day it occurred. 
My daddy was a big man. He weighed about 275 to 300. He had arms that seemed like they were like saw logs because that's what he did for a living. And up until about three years before he died, he did it with a crosscut saw and a double bit chopping ax. That's what he had to log with. And, uh, but not only that, not only was he a physical specimen of a strong man, but he was a man of great moral character and a man of great spiritual fortitude. And those are the things that were handed down to me as the remembrances of my father. And I want you to know I cherish every one of those things. We're living in a time when everything and every definition of anything that we know and have believed in and trusted in for all these years is being questioned and is being thrown aside. Um, well, yeah, I wasn't gonna do it, but I am. <laughs> remember remember old, old Red Skelton? He played the mean little kid. And he'd say, if I do it, I did a whooping. I do it anyway. And I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, according to the last thing that I read, reportedly there are 33 genders in America. Those are the kind of people who try to go get eggs from a rooster. <laughs> and it's not going to work. I believe men need to be men. Now, I want to tell you something. We can't all look like we walked out of the pages of Marlboro Country. And some of y'all are old enough to remember the Marlboro man. He was supposed to be something really special, you know. Uh, he just another guy with his shirt unbuttoned as far as I was concerned. <laughs> but we need to be men. And that means something. It means standing when no one else will stand. It means being courageous when no one else will be courageous. It means taking your family under your wing and being protective of them because families need protection in this society that is assailing the family from every angle. The father needs to be that protective umbrella under the authority of God that is shielding his family from the darts of the evil one. We need to be men who are fearless. You know, our greatest fear does not need to be death, men. Our greatest fear needs to be disappointing the one who called us out of darkness into light. That we need to live before him in such a way and in such a manner that as those who come after us look at us, they will look at us and say, you know what, I want to be like him. Last night I was thinking about those who've gone before me. I, I, I didn't get to know my dad very long. I didn't get to know either one of my grandfathers. Uh, one died in 1922, one died in 1932. And I never got to see these men. But you know, they're the ones who raised my parents. And through those men, God gave me good parents and godly parents. And I know that for my grandchildren, that hopefully I'm the one who gave them at least one good parent in their lives. I had one of my grandsons come to me. His name is bigger than he is, Garrett Anderson McAnally. I know he's going to be president someday with a name like that. Garrett, at his tender young age, has already lost three of his grandparents to death. My wife first, his mother's father by cancer about a month after my wife died. And then he lost last year his other grandmother, from Alzheimer's disease at 51 years of age. And Garrett likes to crawl up in Papaw's lap and I said, you better do that while you're still small enough to do it because my lap is, is getting smaller. Some of y'all will understand that. More I eat, it gets smaller, it just does. And I said, you're getting bigger. And he said, Papaw, I've already lost Mamo. And I've lost Chief, his other grandfather, and I, and I lost uh, my Nana. 
He said, you're going to have to live a long time. And I thought, Lord, I hope I do. Because I hope I get to instill in them some of the things that were instilled in me. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't get here. You know, I told you all last, last Sunday about a post turtle. A post turtle, if you see one, a turtle on a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. Somebody put him up there. And I want you to know that what I know in my life and what I've been exposed to and the things that I believe, I didn't get here by myself. It was generations before me who paved the way and made the beliefs and made the decisions and stood firm and strong that brought me to the place where I am today. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we won't turn there, but I just want to say this. It's Paul giving advice to the men of Corinth in the last chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. He says, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Stand up like men and don't be afraid. That means have a, have a, 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 a backbone the size of a saw log. It means having a rib cage like floor joists. It means having the hide of a rhinoceros and the heart of a saint and having compassion for your family and not be afraid of anything, but trust in God for everything. You know, I know I'm an enigma to my kids. They still look at me like, what? <laughs> my poor little daughter, she's like her mama. And my daughter's 39 years old now, 38, I forget now. Sorry, hon. <laughs> but uh, she just looks at me like, how did mom do it all those years? How did she do it? How did she put up with you? You know, I said, well, she was a gracious woman. Just be gracious like her. You know, my boys, Lord help me, they just like me. Uh, but they know one thing about dad. I've never made them guess where I stood about anything. Because I don't beat around the bush. Y'all have probably figured that out, right? I don't, I don't beat around the bush. I believe in standing where you need to stand. I believe in being firm where you need to be firm. I believe in being compassionate where you need to be compassionate. I believe in being loving always. And I believe in being under the authority of holy God. And I believe in standing as a man. I don't want them to ever think of me as anything else. But my dad was a man who stood for his convictions. We need that so desperately in our day. And men, we've got to decide who we're going to be. You know, I, I'm amazed because I'm living in the town where I grew up and I'm amazed the guys my age that never have grown up and never have become adults. They're still playing little old childish games and stuff like that. And I want to tell you something, life's going to be over with before you can snap your finger and it's too short to waste any of it. And you need to invest it. You just need to be pouring it in to those who come after you, to your kids and to your grandkids and to your great grandkids and on down the line. As God gives it to you, pass it on so it'll be held on to another generation. Something precious to have. My oldest grandson was talking with me the other day. He was at my house. He said, Papa, I don't ever remember you spanking me. I said, trust me, if I'd done it, you would have remembered it. Because I, you know, I, I'm one of those that still believes in that. I, I, I know what time out is. Time out's what I had to take to heal after my mom and daddy got hold of me. And I was that way with my kids. They survived it. Uh, they're not axe murderers or anything like that today. They're, they're, none of them spent a day in jail or anything like that. But he said, you'd never spanked me, have you? And I said, no. I said, but you never disobeyed me either. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, I guess maybe it's because I always believed that you meant what you said. I think that's one of the best things anybody ever said to me. You always, 
I always believed that you meant what you said. And I, and I looked at him, he's about six foot four now, and I said, and I still do, big boy. <laughs> oh, guys, how we need to be men. Not after the definition of the world. The world doesn't even know how to define what it is. Amen? My goodness, I, I was privileged to hear the last sermon I heard Dr. W.A. Criswell preach was at the Southern Baptist Convention in Atlanta many years ago. And Dr. Criswell was 87 years of age. Still very vital and alive. Still teach you how to shake hands. You know, you knew you'd shook hands, but you didn't get a dead fish. You, you got a handshake from him. And he was talking about us pastors. Now, I'm not talking about anybody, but he said, when I see a little old sissy pastor, now here's Dr. W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas for 47 years. He said, when I see a little old sissy pastor, I want to ask him, what was his maiden name? <laughs> Be men. Be men. That's the greatest calling on your life is to be a man of God. Because if you're not a man of God, you can't be a husband of God and you can't be a father to your children of God. You can't be. Let's move to the arena of a man as a husband. Trust it into your care, gentlemen, as married men is one of the greatest treasures you'll ever know in your life. The life and the heart of a woman. And oh my, oh my, what a treasure that is. I was talking with a friend of mine at the round table at the local cafe yesterday. He's 83 years of age. He lost his wife of a lifetime last year to cancer. I preached her funeral service for him. He and I have been friends as long as I've been alive. And he sat there and he wept. And he said, oh, how incomplete I feel without her with me. But he said, you understand that, don't you? And I. I want you to know the closest I ever came to losing my mind was the day after my children went home. And I was in that big old house rattling around like a dry pea in a, in a, in a barrel and not hearing a sound. A house that had been so filled with laughter and music and wonderful things all of a sudden became dead silent and I was incomplete once more. Oh, that hurt. You know what, ladies? Y'all have one of the greatest callings on earth, and that is to make us guys complete. You are God's completion for us. We're the rough draft. Y'all are the emery cloth that comes along and smooths the rough edges off us old guys. And y'all are a beautiful fragrance in the nostrils of God. And God bless you for being in our lives. I want you to know that God has a great responsibility given to us. And I know guys will beat on their chest and they'll say, I'm the head of this house. No, you're not. If God's not, then you don't have a head. And anything without a head is dead. And anything with more than one head is a freak. Husbands, love your wives. I hear these old boys all the time talking about, my old lady. And I'm not a fighter, except when I have to. <laughs> but I sure would like to take them out behind the barn and explain a few things to them. Well, don't look at me like that. Y'all felt that way too. <laughs> 
No. If she's your old lady, you don't have much of a marriage. You never speak disrespectfully to your wife. You never speak disrespectfully about your wife. Because she didn't get no prize when you got, she got you either. I thought the ladies would pipe in right, right about then. <laughs> we are to love them. By loving them, that means that we respect them. That means that we treat them with dignity and honor. We never down talk to them. Listen, folks, I, I know one thing. Once in my life, but twice in my life, I've married way over my head. And I've gotten gracious women in my life uh, that have blessed me. And I want you to understand this, that when we love them, we treat them with that kind of regard. We treat them as an equal and a partner in our relationship. You say, but I'm the head of the house. I always figured this. If you have to tell somebody you're in charge, you're probably not. Because it takes both of you to complete what God calls a marriage. And we're to love them with an uncommon love. That is the love that Christ loved the church with and gave himself for it. It's a self-sacrificial love. There are a million times, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this, there, there'll be a million times in your lifetime when you're just about to do something. You've got your mind on something and you get interrupted by the word, honey. And what that means is press pause. Because there may be an agenda that's more pressing than your agenda that you need to tend to. That's what we're to do. There should never be any doubt in the heart of a wife that her husband wouldn't do anything in his power under the sun for her. A husband needs to be a protector of his wife. Anybody that comes against his wife in any shape, form, or fashion, even if it's one of your kids, you need to stand up for your wife. And you need to be her strength. She looks to you for protection. My wife knows that she's going to be protected. She told me that not too long ago. She said, I know one thing. If anything or anybody tried to get at me, it'd have to come through you first, and it would have an awful time doing that. You know why? Because that woman means the world to me. And that's what God's called us to do, to love our wives. And if you want to do your kids a favor, you love the mother of your children. You love them. It wasn't a scripted act. It wasn't anything that was played out. But when the mother of my children was dying, I sat for days and held her hand. I forgot to eat. I forgot to drink. I forgot to do anything. Because the most precious person on earth to me was slipping away. And my kids were in that room. And they watched. And my daughter said, Dad, I know that when you got married, you promised till death do us part. And I know now you meant every word of it. And we teach them. We teach them without knowing we're teaching them. You know, if you, if you get your kids out, and I'll deal with them in a minute, 
But if you get your kids out and line them up and say, all right, now I'm going to teach y'all something. Boom. School's in. Hmm. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. But you do it by life. And you want your sons to be men who treat their wives lovingly and according to the scripture. You treat their mother lovingly and according to the scripture. And if you want your daughters to marry a man that will treat them like a queen, you treat her mother like a queen. Amen? I'm so grateful for my son-in-law. I've got one daughter. And even if he is a Yankee, We still remember 1861. But anyway, um, he's not a bad guy. In fact, if I had been choosing someone, I couldn't have found a better man for my, for my daughter. But you know what? He saw that model in his house with his mom and dad. And I'm so grateful for that. You know what we're doing, folks? I'm fixing to switch to kids here in a minute. We're not raising kids. We're raising future generations. We're raising future fathers and mothers and grandparents. And if they don't learn it from us, where are they going to learn it? Oprah? And you fathers... And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. What does that mean? I believe it means don't give them a negative impression of you and try to tell them to be different than you are. I remember seeing so, when I was playing ball in high school, I remember this old daddy, he smoked camel, no filters, you know. Had one hanging there on his lip all the time. And he got in his son's face and he said, I'm going to tell you one thing. If I catch you smoking, I'm going to beat the tar out of you. I know what that boy had under the front seat of his pickup too. He had a package of camel, no filters. We can't give wrong impressions to our kids. We can't tell them to do one thing if we're not willing to do it ourselves. We can't do that. There's too much of that going on as it is. When my daddy got his first chainsaw, you'll appreciate this, Michael, as a logger. It was a McCulloch. It weighed about 900 pounds, you know. And, they, and, and it cost $375, and in 1957, that was a lot of money. Bunch of money. But they... They had a promotional thing. They had toy McCulloch chainsaws. With a purchase of a McCulloch chainsaw, your son can have one of these little chainsaws. You know? So when Dad got his chainsaw, I got one. Now, I had overalls just like his. I had a blue jean jumper just like his. In fact, I even, he wore one of those striped... Uh, I call them engineer's caps. He wore one of those. I had one of those. And I've got a picture of Dad cutting up wood over there at the wood pile for our, for our, our wood stove. And I'm out there with my little old chainsaw just wee, wee, wee. Didn't cut anything. He just made noise. But you know what I was doing? I was doing what we do in life. We mimic what we see. We mimic what we see. We're not so much taught as we grow by example. As I got a little bit bigger, my grandpa was an old, he wasn't my real grandpa, he was my step-grandpa, but he's the only thing I ever knew. And he was a great old man, and I loved him dearly. And he had some pine poles that needed peeling and cutting. And he said, son, 
I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to teach you how to do this. He was a smart old guy. So he hauled out. He had a billet saw, you know, and he tried to teach me how to use that billet saw. He said, now, watch me, son. Watch me. You got to get the rhythm going here. And he said, now, take over. And I took over, and I was going like that. And he used some old expressions. You'll have to reach back. You'll understand what I'm saying. He'd go, that's the time. That's the time. Look at that, what you're doing. You cutting wood. That's the time. And then he handed me a draw knife. How many of y'all ever used a draw knife? He said, now, sit straddle of this pole and start peeling that bark off like this. And I was making a mess of it, and he said, no. He says, and here's another good old expression. He says, you ape what I'm doing. Monkey see, monkey do. You ape what I'm doing. He showed me how to do it. And I learned to peel pine poles from my grandpa teaching me how to peel pine poles. We learn life by parents teaching us how to live life. And how in the world, look, folks, if we don't teach them, the world's going to. If we don't give them godly instruction, the devil's waiting in the wings to inject his poison into their system. I tell my grandkids, they come to our house, I say, y'all turn them phones off. Turn them off. I said, I've got a wonderful toy for y'all to play with. I said, I enjoyed it all my growing up. It's called outside. If you're out there, you're not messing up the house for one thing. You don't have your nose stuck in something with a screen. I said, you're going to have to interact with each other. Outside. Let's do this. I teach them things that I learned when I was growing up. Show them things. Now, they may go right back in the house and pick up that phone, but at least they, they, they got another look at something. Don't, don't cause your children to rebel. And I believe a lot of parents do because they preach one thing to them and live another in front of them. And I realize you can do the best job you possibly can, and sometimes they're going to rebel anyway because they've got a mind of their own. But you can't stand before holy God if you do everything that you can. You can't stand before him and say, I at least did not try. Because I think that one of the greatest responsibilities in life is the raising of children. And they become who we teach them they need to become. So, and you fathers, big responsibility here. First thing we got to do is just be who we need to be before God. You know, it's taken a long time. It's, it's a shame that it takes a long time to learn some of life's lessons, huh? I used to have a real quick temper. Y'all wouldn't believe somebody as sweet as me had have one of those. I used to have a real quick one. I mean, I, I was, by the way, my grandfather's names were James and John, the sons of thunder. <laughs> okay? I can't help it. No, I could help it. And my mother was a worry wart. She taught me how to worry. She was good at that. And I came to a conclusion here a few years ago that I'm not going to die of two things. Now, I don't know what's going to get me, but I know two things that are not going to get me. Anger and worry. And I'm trying to teach that to my kids. Man, anger is just a prison that you lock yourself in and you throw away the key. It's the dumbest thing in the world to go around being angry about somebody, something. It's not going to change it in the least bit. Amen? And you know, my, my kids are going, Pop, what's happened to you? I said, it's because you're not ever too old to learn how you need to be as a man. And I don't get mad. Just try not to do that. 
but God's help, I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about it. Goodness gracious, let somebody else worry about it. They will. I'm not going to. You know what I want to do? I want to live my life so that my kids, my grandkids, if I live long enough to have great grandkids and I got an engaged granddaughter, so maybe so, that they'll be able to look back and say, you know what, that old bald headed fella, he knew a few things. And he taught us just by the way he did it, by the way he lived. We got a great responsibility, man. We really do. But it's a glorious responsibility. We get to pass on something that is really hurting in America today. We get to pass on manhood. We get to pass on manhood. And you know what? That's important for the girls in your life, too, because they're going to look at you and say, you know what? I'd like to find me somebody just like my dad, just like my grandpa. And I, I you know, I, I had a good sit down. My granddaughter has chosen well. She's chosen a, an, an unbelievable young man. And I told her, I said, you always expect the best because you deserve nothing less than the best. Don't you settle for anything. You look for God's man for you. And I want to tell you something, folks. This family thing, it's a God thing. Guess who thought it up? When I do a wedding ceremony, I always say this. The first institution in the mind of God was not the church. It was the home. It was the family. And God put it together when he brought the first man and the first woman together in the garden. And the two became one. And they became the mother and father of all the human race. But I want you to know that God's got a pattern, a design, and a plan. And if we follow that plan, it's going to turn out all right. If we don't follow that plan, well, look at it this way. If you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so many are. And I believe that's the root problem of society today is the disintegration of the home. And the man carries a big responsibility in that because we need men who will be godly men. This last Monday... I preached the funeral service to my oldest cousin. He was 86 years old. Had three children, numerous grandchildren. And I went to Stuttgart. He was deacon in First Baptist Church of Stuttgart. That church was full of people of his age who admired him. His sons and his daughter were there. And you know, they were, they were sad, yes. And his dear wife of 65 years was there. And I heard the same thing from each one of them. His wife, Nancy, said, Otis couldn't have been a godlier man. And she lived with him 65 years behind closed doors where nobody could see. And she still said that about him. And his sons and his daughter said the same thing. We couldn't have had a better daddy. Oh, what a blessing we have in the hollow of our hands, men. And we get to pass this on to those who come after us. Let's do it. Let's do with all of our might what God has charged us to do. Your most important task in life is not your job. It's not your civic obligations. It's not your pastimes. Your greatest responsibility on earth is to serve God as the head of your family and lead them to love the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Enough talk. 
We need to live it. Bow your heads with me, if you please. You know, you may be here this morning and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus. I would love to invite you to come to know the Savior this morning. He can change everything and make all things new. Yes, He can. He can forgive our sins. He can wipe away our past. And He can make all things new. If you need to trust Him this morning, I pray you'll come. Maybe you're looking for a church home. I think this is a great one right here. I really do. And it just may be the Lord's leading you in that direction. Maybe you need to come pray about some need in your life. Whatever the Spirit of God says to you this morning, would you do? Our Father, take this time, I pray. May this be to your glory and praise that we obey you now, that we follow your will and do what you tell us to do. For our highest worship is not singing, it's not praying, it's not preaching, it's not giving, but our highest worship is obedience. So may it be so here this morning. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? To God.